housekeeping out of the way so that we can start our session on time. Thank you all so much for being here and staying with us. And those of you that are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are thrilled to have another session for you today. Um, today we have Cindy Taribrush, who is a friend. She's a friend. She's our colleague. She's been with us many times. She's been on our podcast. Um, she's been a presenter at the conference before. She is an early childhood consultant and the author of the book, Teach the Whole Preschooler, Strategies for Nurturing Developing Minds. She's the co-host of the podcast, How Preschool Teachers Do It. She's worked with young children for more than 20 years, and she brings so much experience with her. She has experience teaching in programs, directing in childcare, preschool, and school age programs. She's a sought after workshop facilitator, keynote speaker, and professional development provider for early childhood professional nationwide. She's an associate faculty member here at UAGC and a subject matter expert for the Institute for Families at the School of Social Work at Rutgers University. She has a website that she is going to share with us at the end of the presentation, but we are just so honored to have her back with us to share her wealth of knowledge. Cindy, next slide, please. We kindly request your attention before moving on just for a brief moment to read the disclaimer on the screen. In the spirit and transparency and respect for our community, we have some information that we'd like for you to read in the on-screen disclaimer. By taking a few moments to read through the disclaimer, you empower yourself with the pertinent information regarding the boundaries of our knowledge sharing environment. Next slide, please. Take a moment to read through this slide also. Then together we'll embark upon this exciting session where we push boundaries and leave an indelible mark on the ever evolving landscape of early childhood education knowledge. Cindy, welcome. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be back at this conference and to have the opportunity to talk with everyone about the importance of children being creative and using that creativity to be inventive. We, for a long time in early education have mistaken our thinking processes with creativity coming from children. So I hope to be able to clear up any misconceptions that you have and really inspire you to promote the creativity of the young children that you work with. We're going to be thinking about that word creativity a lot during this session, actually two words, creativity and inventiveness. So let's start with talking about what they really are. We need to understand what creativity is because it's not what you may be ex have experienced in your classroom or even as a student. Creativity is self-expression. The ideas come from the person who is creating. The child in our early childhood settings would be doing the thinking, the decision-making and the creating. And when we allow creativity to truly be self-expression, what children get the opportunity to do is to build upon, upon their prior experiences. And education depends on that. Educating young children depends on scaffolding. So we want to them to be able to add to their existing knowledge. It's kind of like the scaffolding on a building when we talk about scaffolding. A building has a basic structure and let's say you wanna add rooms to it. We put up scaffolding to support the existing structure and to support the workers who will help put on those additional rooms. Children's knowledge works sort of the same way. No matter what age they are, they come to us with an existing structure of experiences, biology, knowledge. And what we need to do is start with what they already know and have experienced, be the scaffolding. You are the scaffolding because you're supporting them as we attempt to add more. It's like adding rooms in their brain. In order for children to add to what they already know and can do, they themselves have to be building on their prior experiences. And it gives them, creativity gives them the opportunity to communicate a lot of things to us. They get to communicate their interpretation of the experiences that they've had. They get to communicate their emotions, their feelings, that they really don't have another way to communicate. 
And they communicate their understandings, knowledge, skills, and abilities to us when they're being creative. So the subject of what they're going to do and how they're going to do it comes from them and builds upon what they already know. That sort of creativity feeds inventiveness. When people are being inventive, they take existing materials and objects and find entirely new ways to use them, like the light bulb that you see on the screen. The parts of the light bulb existed, but the inventor put them together in a way that they created something entirely new and useful to people. And I have seen children do this. I have seen children create entirely new and useful ways to reach things that are out of their reach, to roll things, to make things bigger or smaller. I have seen them create the ways themselves. If only we as adults would give them the space to do that. So they are finding new ways to express thoughts that are in their heads and to solve problems like the light bulb solved a problem. It's very important that we allow children to be creative and inventive, especially in this era. We are living in a creative and an inventive time. There was a time when our schools really were first being formed in this nation where it was the industrial age. And so everything was very cookie cutter and everything was very much like the Ford assembly line, right? So we took children and we taught them all in the same way and we had them memorize a whole bunch of things because they didn't have the internet back then. So they, they had to memorize a whole bunch of things and then we would test them and if 65% or more stuck, the assembly line would move forward and they would move forward all together to be taught the same way again. Well, that was somewhat useful when that was created because we were living in an industrial and factory time. But that is not what we're living in now. And that is not what the future holds for these children. Think about all of the things that have been invented in your lifetime. For me, I mean, everything we're using right now was invented in my lifetime. The internet, Zoom, um, home computers, all invented my lifetime. Your cell phone, um, streaming services, cable TV, maybe all these things, right? So there's a this time of massive invention and creativity. Everyone always coming up with new ways and things that they think are gonna help solve problems and new ideas. Most recently, we have a lot of AI software being invented. These children need to grow up in that mind space where they have confidence in their own ideas and their own abilities to be inventive. And in fact, a researcher who's pretty well known, and if you have never heard of her, I want to highly encourage Sorry, you to look I her don't up. Have an answer for that. Oh, my Alexa went off. Sorry, folks. Um, not you. Um, so I want you to have you look her up because she is brilliant. She has many best-selling books. She uh, also has one of the most listened to TED Talks ever. It's on YouTube. She has a special on Netflix about courage and a series on HBO about emotions and humans kind of wading through their feelings. Her name is Dr. Brene Brown. She's from the University of Houston. She has a fellowship chair there and she works in the Department of Social Work. But her area of study, her area of research is shame and vulnerability. So she's done a lot of work around of the you know shame and vulnerability attached to creativity because being creative I'm here to tell you I'm someone who's written and I write and I have a lot of creative pursuits and there's a certain amount of vulnerability that has to go into that but she also pointed out what it says on the screen which is that the only unique contribution that we will ever make in this world will be born of our creativity she also teaches that there is no such thing as people who are not creative. So if you're sitting there now thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't think I'm so creative. There's no such thing. There's only unused creativity. And Dr. Brown teaches that unused creativity is not benign. It actually becomes emotions like fear, judgment, sorrow, and anger. We all have the ability to be creative within us. The question is, are we going to embrace the vulnerability of it? And we can teach children to do that if we support their creativity in the early childhood years. Many adults are hesitant to explore their own creativity because they it was not valued when they were young. And we don't want to do that to young children. We know 
that their brains, the architecture of their brains is being developed in those early childhood years. And to be clear, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, NAICI, N-A-E-Y-C, our professional organization in early education, defines early childhood as birth to age eight. So from birth to age eight, the wiring in the brain and the creativity in the brain is being set. The experiences that the children have, both doing things and seeing how much it's valued, teaches them about the world, about themselves and their own worth, and helps to set that architecture in the brain. When we allow children to be fully creative, we are building essential thinking skills. And again, fully creative means they are self-expressing. I, as the adult, am not telling them what to do, what to make, what to use. They are deciding that. And I want you to imagine doing that for a second. Imagine that you're given a blank piece of paper or you have a blank piece of paper in front of you and you're told to do whatever you want with it. Think about the thinking process that has to take place. I have done that activity when I've conducted this session with live with learners, both virtually and in person. And I always tell them, grab a blank piece of paper and I'm going to tell you what to do with it. And they pull out paper and I say to them, all right, here's what I want you to do with it. Anything you want to do with it. And for a lot of adults, that stymies them because they're not used to being allowed to do whatever they want with things. But after a few minutes, here's what I see. I look around and I see some people made paper airplanes. Some people drew something. Some people drew something related to a place they want to go, for example. Some people started to write their shopping list. Other people made things that they remember from childhood, which is that connection to the past. Some of you may remember like I do. I don't know if you can see my hands, but those um, fortune tellers that we used to make and put on our fingers, a lot of people make those when I ask them to do this. And then I say to them, what did you have to do? What was your thinking process? And they talk about how they had to decide what to do with the paper. They had to mentally plan how they would do it. They had to figure out how they would execute that plan. And as they were executing the plan, they had to evaluate what they were doing to determine if it was turning out the way that they wanted to do, do it. When we look at children and we say, here's what I want you to make, we take all that thinking away from them because now we're the decision makers. There's also been this idea out in the world that when we say to children something like, I want you to make a bird, but you can decorate it however you want, that that's fully creative. And it's not because the adult said, make a bird. And as soon as we do that, we take a good part of that thinking process away from the children. When we take that away, we take away the opportunity for them to begin to lay the foundation for higher level thinking skills and for them to become confident in the knowledge that they themselves are capable. They themselves are capable of creating things. We want to have a positive impact on their self-worth. And we can do that by letting them make whatever they want to do or do whatever they want to do without any ideas from us and then valuing it. I'm going to show you some examples. Creativity takes place in a lot of different areas of your classroom. Sometimes people think, oh, creativity is in the art area, but that's not true. The arts are more than just the art area even. So creativity may take place in your art area. That's the visual arts, you know, and so you might have things like you see on the screen here. You might have one-dimensional drawings. You might give children clay or Play-Doh, and now they're creating 3D art, which, by the way, is also very important. There might be a variety of materials, and hopefully there are, that you have in your visual arts area. And there's something that you need to keep in mind when the children go over there. True art, folks, true art has no direction from the adults. The children are going over and they're deciding what they're going to do, what they're going to make, how it's going to look. The children have no sample to look at. I'm not showing them an example. Like, for example, I'm not saying to them, 
Here is an example of what a penguin looks like. Now you create it however you want. I'm not doing that. Because again, that shuts down some of their decision-making. As the adult in the room, I have no particular product in mind. I just want the children to experience the process of creating. And you can see, hopefully on this slide, I'm gonna actually, I can make it a little bigger the way I have my slides. These children were coming up the, with the ideas on their own. And there's a few things that you can see when we take a good look at what's on the screen right now. So when you take a good look at this, you can see that everyone's drawings are different. And not only that, but you can see different developmental levels of children. And this gives you information about the children's skills and abilities and what they would probably benefit from some practice in. So hopefully I made that big enough where you can really see. What I can see here are a few things. I can see that some children are still in the stage where they're mostly scribbling, which is important by the way. Scribbling is the first step to learning how to write your name and other words. So we want them to have plenty of scribbling time. And then I see some people have moved past that. Some of the children have moved past that and they're creating things that, that have human forms, right? So if we look here on the top, on the upper right, we basically get just a human head. The next stage of development is what you see in the middle row over on the left, where you have the heads with just legs. That's by Noah. Noah was the next stage of development. And then after Noah, the next stage of development is Daya's drawing, where now the characters have bodies. This not only allows the children to succeed at whatever developmental level they're at, and we need children to know that they can succeed at what they're doing. We can't consistently give them things that they can't succeed at. This is something they can succeed at. And it informs us, it lets me know where they are, what they're thinking about and where their development is. So this is a very valuable bulletin board in a classroom. And I, I took this picture. When I visited this class, I stood in front of this for a little while and the teacher and I discussed this. We talked about the creativity. We talked about um, things like the developmental levels. We talked about what is obviously important to the children in their world. So I hope that you get the chance to really sit back and look at the visual art that your students are creating. Another place where children are very creative is in the dramatic play area. Pretend play is essential in the early childhood years. Pretend play is very important because it's the beginning of children learning symbolism and they have to understand symbolism in order to eventually read and have reading comprehension skills. Why is that? Because a letter is a symbol for a sound. Those letters come together to form words that are symbols for something in the world that may not be in the room with you. And children have to understand that. So what they're doing when they pretend, they'll go home and pretend to be you. In our programs, they often pretend to be their families or their friends or even their pet. What they're doing is they're discovering that one thing can stand for another. If they're pretending to be their families, they are in this dramatic play area representing their families. So that's a very important beginning. And truly creative dramatic play has no direction from the adults. I am not suggesting any sort of dramatic play. I'm just giving them access to all sorts of materials where they can create the environment and they can create the environment that they want to use. Pretend play has no example to watch. I'm not showing them any kind of video and hoping it inspires them to do something over there or acting something out and hoping it inspires them to do something over there. They get to go over and decide. And I, as the adult, have no outcome in mind. And in fact, when children are in the dramatic play area, it is very important that I go over there and find out what the story is. They're making stories over there. They are storytellers, which again is a foundation for later reading comprehension skills. So I need to let them make up the story and I can't make any assumptions about it. I was in a classroom one time and the children were using um, fake flowers and they had the cash register from their dramatic play area. And I saw one of the adults go over and say something about the flower shop. That was an assumption. 
I'm pretty sure I've gotten gas station sold flowers at some point in my life when my husband maybe was in a rush on an anniversary or a holiday. You can buy flowers in the supermarket. You can buy flowers in a lot of places. And by the way, even though they're manipulating the flowers, we don't know that they're thinking of them in the same way that we are. They could be pretending that they're something else. So in order to support their creativity in the dramatic play area, I encourage you to go over and ask the children what story is happening here. And if you're going to participate for a few minutes, it has to be in their story. You can't come in and just suddenly do something that changes it. Another example from the dramatic play area, children were playing restaurant and an adult went over, sat down and said, I'd like to order a slice of pizza. Well, maybe they were pretending that it was not a pizza place, that it was somewhere where you would order chicken nuggets instead. We don't know unless we ask. But as soon as an adult goes over and says something like, I'd like to order pizza, the children change what they're doing. The children will all of a sudden now be pretending pizza shop because it was e expressed by the adult. So let's not do that. Let's let them tell us what they're creating, what world they're creating over there. The next area in a classroom where children should be allowed to be creative, but often or not, is music and movement. Music and movement should be an area available to the children during free play time so that they can create sound on their own and they can create movement on their own. Yes, I know you're going to sing songs with them during the day. And of course you should, because we're trying to teach the children certain things through the music that we sing with them. We may be teaching them different body parts. For example, when you do head, shoulders, knees, and toes, or a song like that, you may be supporting their fine motor movement with something like Itsy Bitsy Spider. We are teaching them the rhythm and sounds of our language when we sing with them. And so it's important that we do that, but it's also important that you have a space and the opportunity for these children to explore music and movement on their own. And I know people get, you know, they get a little nervous about that. They think, oh my gosh, it's going to be so noisy all the time. Okay, first, you don't have to put out your noisiest instruments all the time, but they do need the ability to have things that make sound. For younger children, you know what they love to make sound with? Things like pots and pans and wooden spoons. Doesn't even have to be formal instruments. You can give them a variety of things where they'll know in this area of the room, we use this to make sounds. So in the music and movement area, there's no direction from us. There's no song we're introducing. I'm not putting anything on a CD player. I'm not playing any kind of video for them. They're deciding how to make sound. So there's nothing for them to watch. There's no demonstration. And I don't have any song or movement in mind. They're going to do it. And if it helps you to think about this as something that's possible in your classroom, here's my real world experience. When you first allow children who are not used to having free access to music and to instruments, when you first put that out and they have free access to it, they're all attracted to it because it's been a forbidden thing. In so many classrooms, the instruments live in a box that go in the teacher's closet and they only come out sometimes. And so they're very treasured. When we put it out, in the beginning, about the first two weeks, everyone's going to be enthralled with it. And then you're going to watch something happen. You're going to watch the children who really like the blocks go back to blocks. And you're going to watch the children who love dramatic play go back to dramatic play. And eventually, in that music area and that movement area, you're going to have children whose talents tend to lean into music and movement. And everybody else has dispersed to what they're most comfortable in. And, and I know you're listening right now if you're unsure of this and you're thinking, I don't know, are you sure? I have had many teachers come back to me and say, I can't believe how right you were. It was like two to three weeks, depending on how many hours the children are in the program and how much free play they have, two to three weeks. And then all the children dispersed and the music and movement area was not as busy as you may be anticipating. Please allow them to do this, to create with music and movement. Because again, that's one of the, uh, one of the arts. So much skill building takes place. When we let the children do the thinking, it crosses all the domains and areas of learning. Children use physical skills to create. They use social emotional skills to create because they're expressing themselves. 
They build language and literacy skills and they're laying the foundation for future com reading comprehension. They are crossing all domains. They're using cognitive skills because they're thinking deeply. They are the doers of the action. So here's what I see less of in early childhood classrooms and you will not find in high quality curricular approaches, um, you won't find it in their materials and that's crafts. Crafts are all about the product when really early education should be all about the process. So crafts are about the product. A craft is any time that we look at the children and say, let's make this. It limits their brain building. It limits their skill building. I, as the adult now, I'm doing the heavy lifting of the thinking. It limits their, their ability to come up with ideas. And here's what some really interesting research showed. Really interesting research has taken place about the impact of process or product-based learning. And when they went to children who were in pre-K and kindergarten and who had mostly experienced crafts, and they said to those children, what is art? Instead of saying art is how I draw what I'm thinking or art is how I draw what I'm feeling or art is what I make. Instead of saying that, the children told the researchers that art is something I do because the grownups want me to. That's also not what we want them to think. And I want to be really clear about three words that we have mixed up in early education. Those three words are, by now you know, one of them is art, another one is craft, and the third one is project. Those are not the same thing. Art, as we have been saying, is self-expression. A craft is when an adult comes up with an idea and asks the children to complete a product, which takes a lot of the thinking away from them. A project is something entirely different. A project is a long-term investigation into a topic of interest to children, during which children do experiments, explorations, and investigations to answer their own questions and satisfy their own curiosity. That's like a learning session for a whole other day. But let's please use these words properly. Art, self-creation, craft, a product that the adults need me to do. A project is a long-term exploration into a topic of interest to children. And for this session where we're talking about creativity, we're really focused on that art because it encourages deeper thinking. And that's what we want to do. It encourages persistence, planning, attention to task, and it encourages children to be willing to take reasonable risks because they understand that whatever thoughts they come up with and mold into that dough or put on that paper or act out in the dramatic play area or create in our music and movement areas, whatever they come up with is valued. We embrace it. And we take their visual art and we put it up on the wall. You know, the environmental rating scales, Eckers and Itters, they say that one third of your display should be children's original work. Children's creative art should be a third of, their, of the displays because when they see us hang it up, their thoughts, just like they see things hung up in their homes and other places they go, they see valuable things hung up. Maybe it's pictures of family or other pictures or artwork that they see places that they know must have great value because it's hanging on the walls. When I take, like we saw earlier in the slides, their paint blobs, their scribbles, their creations, their collages, however they make them, and I hang that on the wall, what they learn is my thoughts are valued, my thoughts can contribute to everybody, and so they're more willing to take reasonable risks. Reasonable risk taking is when they're willing to take the risk of not doing something perfectly. And we need them to be willing to take those risks in order to build their learning. Because you know when you first do a skill, it's not necessarily done perfectly. And in all honesty, perfection doesn't exist. We should always be reaching for the best we can do at that moment. Children are more likely to reach for the best they can do in that moment when we allow them to be creative. 
One way that we can find out what they're thinking and what they're trying to invent or create is to bring the thinking out from them. We want to sort of bring the thinking out and give them a vehicle to express that to us. And in some places, especially by the Harvard Graduate School of Education, that's called making thinking visible. We want them to be able to express to us on paper, through art, other art materials, through what they pretend, through their music and through words, right? We wanna give them words for what they're doing. And so we're gonna work with them to make their thinking visible. In order to do that, we have to establish a thinking routine with them. We're gonna teach them a routine for expressing their thoughts and their curiosity. Because when they do that, we can better help them move from individual creativity to inventiveness and to creating as a team. But we need to bring that thinking out and we need to continually deepen what they're thinking about. So the, there are several thinking routines that you can teach young children. And I'm gonna share the one with you that I think works best in the early childhood years. The thinking routine for early childhood is I see, I think, I wonder. And I want them to talk about many things like this. You as the adults are gonna to have to demonstrate this so they begin to catch on. We out loud are going to talk about what we see, think, and wonder in this order. Cause remember it's a routine and routines are done in the same order all the time. So I will look at children, let's say we're outside for example. I will look at children and I will say something like, I see the clouds, I think they're moving. I wonder where they're going. I might see something, say something like, I see the tree. I think it has a lot of bugs on it. I wonder what they're doing. This helps us and the children to bring curiosity to the forefront, bring their thoughts to the forefront. And then I can help them build on what they're creating, doing, and inventing when I know what's in their heads. You as adults, Use this thinking routine all the time. You're just not aware that you do, but you do. And I'll give you an example of how I sometimes use it as an adult. I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's an adult see, think, and wonder. I see people working in some jobs. I think I could never do that. I wonder what drew them to that career. Here's another one. I see some posts on social media. I think I wouldn't post that. I wonder what inspired them to do it. You do this all the time. And we here are early educators. So here's one especially dedicated to us. I see people living in huge homes. I think you're probably not a teacher. I wonder what they do for a living. When you're with children, promote this thinking routine at their level. So you at first are going to do it. You're going to do it yourselves. You might go over to something they're creating in the art area and say, I see you're using many different color crayons. I think you're trying to make something. I wonder what it is. What are you trying to make? It won't be long before the children come to you and say things like, I see the grass moving. I think something's blowing it. I wonder what makes that happen. And then you can start talking to them about how we might be able to find out and continue to promote those deep, deeper thinking skills. It won't be long before they pick up the routine if you do it consistently. So when they're doing things like that and you go over to the dramatic play area and you say to them, I see you put out the plates and the cups. I think there must be food involved here. I wonder what's happening. Can you tell me what's happening over here? That will help them to express to you what they're creating and help you understand when they start saying that to you. I wanna encourage you also to ask a whole lot of open-ended questions because it promotes the same thinking skills and areas of the brain that are required for creativity and inventiveness. 
So we're going to ask the children really good open-ended questions, which by the way, are very difficult for adults to formulate. Adults have a hard time with open-ended questions, truly open-ended questions, because we were not asked a lot of open-ended questions when we were young. We were told things and asked to give it back. We were set, we were told, here's the word, now what's the word? There weren't a lot of open-ended questions. And so we struggle with them, but I hope you will go back and practice it. When children are creating, they can be creating something in the block area. They could be building something or inventing something new. They can be creating something anywhere in the classroom. And when you go over and you ask them an open-ended question about it, it helps them to look at what they themselves are creating in new ways. So we might want to say something to them like, what, is, what do you think should happen next? Something where they have to come up with the answer. Open-ended questions do not have a specific right answer. And again, I've practiced open-ended questions with adults and they struggle with it. Very often when I say, um, you know, ask an open-ended question, let's see if it's truly open-ended. If I can give them an answer right away or a child gives you an answer right away, it was not a really good, great question. We want our questions to cause the children to think. I had uh, ch children in my class one year, a lot of them visited their grandparents frequently and they would talk about it. And one time, one of the children said to me, I went to grandma's house. And I said, you went to grandma's house? Why? And he, he stared at me. No one had ever asked him why he goes there. And I said, why are you going to grandma's house? And he looked at me and he said, because she makes cookies with like a question mark at the end. And I said, okay, that's a good reason to go to grandma's house. And I turned to one of the other children. And I said, why do you go to grandma's house? And she looked at me for a second and she said, because my daddy drives there. But they had to think of an answer and it could have been many answers. That's what you're aiming for. Really good questions to ask the children about their creations are things like, what's your favorite part of this? What do you like most about this? What do you think we can add to this? Those are great open-ended questions for creation. One of the keys to building their ability to make the sort of decisions that they need to make when they're looking at a shelf of blocks or a shelf of art materials or a bin of Legos, and they're allowed to do whatever they want with it. One of the things that we need to do to support that thinking is to continually give children the freedom to make choices. I know that's hard because adults are very used to the notion that teachers are the leaders and teachers are in control. It's very hard to separate our idea and definition of what a teacher is and who we are from how we experience teachers. But I want you to do it. I want you to struggle with it, wrestle with it a little bit. The children need the freedom to make choices. As much as you can give them to choose, we wanna bring them to a crossroad all the time so that they have to make the decisions. This can include what they use during playtime, how they will move their bodies, how they will express themselves. Will it be through building, through drawing, through molding, through pretending, through music, through movement? How do you want to express yourself is a great crossroads to be at. And that's why, you know, they're supposed to have free playtime where they choose what they're going to play with in your room. And it's supposed to be at least 60 uninterrupted minutes. So that in that 60 minutes, they're thinking deeply about what they're doing and they have the opportunity to make many choices. I think we all know adults who when given a blank piece of paper and told, do what you want with it, get anxiety. I don't want that for the children. I want them to know that they are strong decision makers. But the only way to build that confidence is to give them choices to make. And they should be reasonable choices. The children will be safe. These are choices you can make. And, and I encourage you to think about the things that you are deciding. And I hope after you leave this session and you go back to working with children, that this question lingers in your mind. Am I deciding things that really the children can decide? Those decision-making skills need to be practiced over and over and over again. And it can look many different ways. It can be, which book do you want to read? 
Which set of gloves do you want to put on if you have more than one there? Which hat do you want to wear? Um, where do you want to sit? Which way do you want to sit? Like during large group time, you can offer them the floor or a chair. Think of all the things they can decide so that when they have the opportunity to create and to be inventive, they feel confident in their own decision-making skills. I have resources for you uh, that I'm going to share with you. And I want to show you what's in these resources before I share with you how to access them and then open up the chat. I believe we are able to open up the chat for questions. I'm going to switch my screen share and I want to show you some things that I've put together for you on a virtual bulletin board called a Padlet. A Padlet, like I said, it's a virtual bulletin board. It's a living bulletin board where I can pin PDF handouts, links to websites, videos, all sorts of things under one QR code, uh, in this case, QR code, or under one link. And as long as you have that or you put it in your favorites in your browser, every time I find something new that relates to this topic and I add it to the Padlet, you'll have access to it. So first, let me show you what a Padlet is and how it's accessed and how it works. And then I'll share with you how to get it on your end. I've put a lot of things here about supporting creative and inventive thinking um, for children, examples and things for you. So let me show you how this works. These are all thumbnail images. And on a Padlet, every column scrolls independently, as you can see me doing on the screen. Every column scrolls independently. So you have to scroll each column to see what's in it. And then horizontally, the whole thing will move back and forth. Like I said, these are all thumbnail images. And when you click on them, things are going to happen. So under videos right here, this is a thumbnail image. It's going to take you to a website where this video lives if you click on it. This is about making thinking visible that I see, I think, I wonder as one of the ways to make thinking visible. This is more information about it. Underneath that, this will take you to a YouTube video. That's about when the unexpected happens and seizing teachable moments. If you want to learn a little more about process art versus product art and the value of process, I highly encourage you to watch this video. This video is from my colleague, Lisa Murphy. Uh, Lisa is otherwise known as the ooey gooey lady in early childhood circles. You may have heard of her. And this is her video. She knows that I share it. This is her video um, about creation and product versus um, product and, and it's great. So please watch it. And underneath that is a YouTube video about the importance of play. Under teacher resources, I'm going to click on this top one where it says creativity, inventiveness, and imagination. And you will see that that's a web link. It's going to open up a website. And here's this resource from the Illinois Early Learning Project about creativity, inventiveness, and imagination. So you can explore that and you can explore that website. Beneath that, is a link to education.com and the article, Can Inventiveness Be Taught? Beneath that is an article from the National Association for the Education of Young Children. I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna take us to NACI's website. And this is about how process-focused art experiences support the preschoolers in your class. This is a nice thing to share with families because they may not know why those scribbles and paint blobs are so valuable. So please go through this Padlet and decide what would be good to share with the families. And then beneath that is an article from Australia about creative activities for preschoolers for learning and development. In the examples of creativity column, I've given you some images from programs where I have consulted and worked with their staff. Here's an example of a display. A third of the displays in this classroom are what you're seeing here on this image. A third of the displays are children's original art. And you can see here, they used whatever materials they wanted in whatever way they wanted. Beneath that are the drawings I showed you earlier. And then another display with various materials to maybe give you some ideas of how to stock your art area. There is a column here for families. This is a link to NACI that brings you to a web page with articles for families about the creative arts. And then I offer you this an article about why getting messy is essential because you know so many people are like, oh, I don't want them to get messy, but creativity is messy. You know how creativity is portrayed in our, on TV and movies as being kind of frantic and messy. 
creativity does cause a mess. So here's something for families about why getting messy is very important. Please share that with them. And then the last column is staying connected with me. Uh, as Stephanie said earlier, I am the co-host of How Preschool Teachers Do It. If you're unfamiliar with my podcast, please join us. Become one of our preschool peeps. We're listened to very proudly nationally and internationally. You can find us on your podcast provider and also starting with the pandemic on YouTube because we knew people needed to see faces. But before the pandemic, we're listen only. And we really, we just passed our five-year anniversary of doing this podcast. So please come. People tell us they binge us and we feel a lot like Netflix. Uh, this is the website, a link to the website for our podcast, a link to my website and the blog that I wrote for many years. I stopped blogging for the most part when I started doing the podcast because that's too many directions for me to think. But the blog is still there and valid and you can look up many topics. And then a link to my book that Stephanie mentioned earlier, Teach the Whole Preschooler Strategies for Nurturing Developing Minds. So I'm going to go back to the slides now and show you how we're going to share these wonderful resources with you. First of all, don't forget, check out How Preschool Teachers Do It podcast. My email is on this slide. And when I stop the screen share, I will also put it in the chat. Um, you're welcome to contact me. You can also contact me through the contact form on my website, how, helping kids achieve, sorry, helpingkidsachieve.com. And here is a QR code. You also need a password. Here's a QR code for you to grab that Padlet. If you hold the camera up on a smartphone or a tablet to the QR code, it will name the, a website, it'll name your browser. Just tap on that. And then it's gonna ask you for word. It's gonna say, you need access, you need to know the word. The word is my first name. I have a lot of Padlets. I'll never remember the passwords if I made a whole bunch of different passwords. And it is case sensitive. So the password has to be uppercase C, lowercase I-N-D-Y. And then once you open that on your browser, put it in your bookmarks or your favorites and go into it periodically. First, go into it and explore it, but then go into it periodically because you never know what I'm going to add. And I, I also want to share with you before I come out of the screen share and look at what's building up in the chat and your q and I want to share with you that the information in this session it was not my invention. There are many resources, including the ones on the Padlet and the ones that you see on your screen right now that support what I'm saying about the value of process over trying to get children to create products all the time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come out of the screen share because I've been watching that chat number go up and I wanna see if there's questions in there too. Uh, let's see, I'm going back. Uh, okay, I think I reached the start of this session. Oh, Amy said art comes from the from my heart. It does. It comes from the children's hearts. Uh, let's see. Erica, you have to let me know what res which research you need, and I will point you to it. How do we allow the creation process and still have them following two to three step directions? Okay. I want to address that. I hope Cal Callie is still here because I really want to address that. Children follow directions all the time. We're is giving them directions. We're telling them when to put their coats on, when to wash their hands, when to sit and eat, when to come over here for large group time, when to go over there for something else. They're following directions all the time. Also, we have to really think about how we use the areas of the room. One of the interest areas that's in the creative curriculum and an area that's recommended by NACI and the environmental rating scales is called the cooking area. That's where they would authentically learn to follow directions, folks. How do you follow directions as an adult? You read step-by-step -step directions like a recipe and maybe you cook something or maybe you're putting together Ikea furniture. I want to give them authentic ways to follow directions and the cooking area. That's one of the primary purposes of that area to have child friendly recipes. And you can find them online with pictures that they can follow and words so that they're following step-by-step -step directions, but never lose sight of the fact that they're following directions all the time, both with you and at home. So it's not that they won't get practice following directions. And now I hope you'll pay attention to how often you're giving directions during the day. Um, Rebecca, I'm glad you like it. I'm going through the chat. Um, let's see. I think, yes, I see, I think, I wonder. I see, I think, I wonder. That's how I'd like you to start talking with the children. 
Uh, how many I, uh, ideal uninterrupted minutes for free play, Crystal? 60 uninterrupted minutes is what the American Academy of Pediatrics, the World Health Organization, and the National Association for the Education of Young Children recommend. 60 uninterrupted minutes. Many people by now have heard that and don't know why. So I wanna take a minute since we have the time to explain why. It's 60 uninterrupted minutes because science has shown that you don't think deeply about what you're doing for at least 40 to 45 minutes. That's true for every human being. And I can think of examples of that. I'm a jigsaw puzzler. I love doing jigsaw puzzles. When I first sit down at my jigsaw puzzle, I know that my husband Todd is talking to me and I'm answering his questions and I know what's happening on my TV show. About 40 to 45 minutes later, I realize I have to rewind what happened on the TV because I missed it. And poor Todd is still talking to me, but I have no idea what he just asked me. 40 to 45 minutes. If we always cut off free play time at 30 minutes, the children never get a chance to deeply think what that, about what they're doing and extend their knowledge. Now, in this time, in this post or COVID era or whatever you want to call it, having been through this pandemic, one of the things that the National Institute for Early Education Research has found was something that we didn't realize was going to happen. I think when the pandemic and lockdown started to happen, we realized that children would probably have fewer self-help self -help skills because they're home with their families. And, you know, let's face it, I'm a parent. I get it. It's much easier for me to look at my children and say, give me that container, I'll open it, than to spend the time having them struggle over it. That's just how families function. So we knew that they would have less self-help skills. We also knew that their socialization skills would probably struggle because families weren't socializing and they weren't socializing at the same sort of rate that they did in the past. Here's what we didn't predict. The NEAR, again, it's the National Institute for Early Education Research, housed in Rutgers. I do some work for Rutgers and I had an opportunity to attend a meeting being run by Dr. Stephen Barnett. You can look him up. He's done a lot of research about the pandemic. And what they found was it was actually the lack of meaningful playtime that was causing skills to fall away and to not be retained. And there's less meaningful playtime happening both at home and in our early childhood programs. At home, because families have changed, there are more hybrid workers. People are struggling now with inflation more to put food on their table and they may be working more. Lots of reasons why play has been impacted at home. But also, play has been impacted in our early childhood environments and the time in which children get to creatively think like this has been impacted because our early childhood programs, but in large part, are short-staffed. So because of that short-staffed and everyone being stretched, there's less opportunity for meaningful conversation with children while they play that can extend their creativity and their thinking. That said, many programs that I work with have independently decided to extend the 60 minutes. I work with some programs who now do at least 75 consecutive uninterrupted minutes and other programs who are doing 90, 90 minutes to try and make up for some of that time that was lost. Um, and when I talk about uninterrupted, I don't mean that you won't have conversations with children. Go over, do your thinking routine, ask them open-ended questions. By uninterrupted, I mean, I'm not calling them away from free play to sit at a table and do something with me. That's a separate time of day called small group. We separate small group out from free play time now because we understand how many teachable moments there are out there that you will miss if you're not available to go out there. Um, let's see. Okay, Erica, I'm glad you think you found it in my references about art and creativity. And if you didn't, I'm going to go into the chat and I'm going to put to everyone my email address. You are welcome to email me if you need something and ask for it. Um, the best way to always reach me is email because I am often on Zoom. Here's my email address. You just have to remind me where you heard me speak because I do this a lot. And when people just get on and say, I need the resource you mentioned, I don't know from where or what. So just do me a favor and be specific about that. Um, I think unless uh, some one of the hosts wants to correct me, Stephanie or Tisha, somebody, I think I hit all the questions in the chat. Oh, there's Q&A also. Hang on. <laughs> We're going many different places with this. Um, okay, let me look at the Q&A. So how do I explain to parents that visual art isn't 
their child's thing. I often tell them that they are exposed to other art representations. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of times when we're talking to families and they have questions like this, like visual art isn't, your child isn't drawn to visual art, something like that. We need to remind people that all of us, it's human nature. We all have certain preferences. We all have certain talents and none of us are going to master everything. Families need to be consistently reminded of that. You know, we grew up in educational systems where they wanted everybody to get an A, but that's not reality. We don't master everything. For me, like I'm never, and you can remind families, have these conversations with them like I'm having with you. I'm never going to be a chef. I am never fully mastering cooking. That's just not something that's in my strongest wheelhouse. And that's okay. Remind them, everyone has preferences. And children can be creative when they're building with blocks and children are creative when they're using Legos. Children can be creative through dramatic arts and through music. There's lots of ways for children to be creative. It's also a good idea to educate families about what the cognitive skills are that are supported through creativity because they will then see them in other ways. Things like persistence, attention to task, um, analyzing and evaluating what they're doing, decision-making, problem solving, all those cognitive skills take place a variety of ways. So you have to teach families, it's not about the product in early education. It's never about the product. It's always about the thinking process. So whatever your children do, as long as we see these thinking processes being supported, it will serve them well in the year to come. Please educate the families about our teaching goals and about cognitive development because they don't know. They don't know. So all they look for then is a product. Um, so thank you, folks. I see the thank yous in the chat. You are, you are so welcome. It is my pleasure. This is like the great passionate part of my work to be able to do this sort of thing. And Cindy, you did a really great job. As you can see, the majority of the chat is truly just accolades for sharing your knowledge with us and also just kind of tapping into the experiences that you have to make them so real and so relevant for our audience members. So thank you for that. While we continue to monitor the chat with Cindy, I'm going to go ahead and share the participation um, file for you on the screen. You are able to take a screenshot of it. You are able to take your phones out and download it.